So, dashing the heads of babies yeah. on rocks. That's pretty rough. But uh, I know that you would expect no less from me. I think my last sermon text referred to uh, temple prostitutes. And before that, it was drunkenness and orgies. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is thank you for coming back. <laughs> thank you for not making a conga line out the, uh, out the rear. Um, you know, that last verse about dashing babies' heads against rocks, it gets a lot of attention. Um, it deserves a sermon of its own. That's just not today's sermon. Biblical scholars have gone so far as to say that they feel embarrassed by Psalm 137 because of that last line. But I don't think there's any cause for embarrassment in Psalm 137. In fact, I think that Psalm 137 is crucial to our identity as a Judeo-Christian people. Who would we be without the stories of Israel's struggle to survive? without the assurance that God never abandons us, even when God's plan is unclear and his methods incomprehensible to us? What would our faith consist of without the stories of people struggling to do God's will in absolutely impossible circumstances? In this text, the psalmist is writing from exile in Babylon. In 598 BCE, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem. He made war on the city for two years before he finally sacked it. During this siege, families starved. There was not enough bread to go around. <clears throat> the people's skin was said to be hot to the touch with the fever of famine. The tongues of the children, dry from thirst, stuck to the tops of their mouths. When they could cry from hunger, and there was no bread for their parents to break, their parents took to the occupied, dangerous streets of Jerusalem in search for bread. And there they found the occupied enemy, which tracked them down beyond the city to the mountains and the wilderness. Hunger is a slow death, and it gave rise to the unthinkable. In Lamentations, we are told that Mothers, the nurturers of the community, boiled their babies in order to survive the destruction of the city. Like gangs, the Babylonian forces roamed the streets and raped women. They extorted the people, depriving them of their own natural resources, demanding payment for basic necessities like water and wood. Those who survived the starvation lived to see their hearts broken as the Babylonian forces violated the temple. They picked it clean of everything of value, carted the spoils back to Babylon, and destroyed the Lord's house down to its foundation. Community elders and men of authority were either killed or enslaved and forced to live out the rest of their days in exile in Babylon. The remnant of Israel left over in Jerusalem were orphans, fatherless children, widows. The captives in Babylon were forced to work for their enemy. They mourned their city's destruction and they mourned for their exile. They wrote lamentations and they wrote songs like Psalm 137, expressing sorrow, <coughs> grief, <coughs> confusion, and rage. I said at the beginning that Psalm 137 is part of our identity as Judeo-Christian people. But where are we in this story? Where is the little white chapel? Let's see, there's the protection 
antagonist. Believers enduring the pain of exile and famine, the antagonist, the Babylonian Empire, and the audience, God. Well, we're not God. Hopefully, we don't conduct ourselves like the Babylonian state. And really, with the freedom that we have to live more or less where we want and the security of food on our tables, we are not the impoverished or exiled Jews either. We like to see ourselves in the text, don't we? I do. If we are not obviously there, we just get creative. And it's pretty easy to do with the Psalms, to spiritualize the oppression and the exile, to make room for a vision of ourselves, right? We all feel the exile of loneliness. We have all pined for a home lost, whether it's we've been away at sleepaway camp or on a business trip or more permanently, we've suffered foreclosure or changed circumstances. And we all experience grief from loss, whether it's the loss of a loved one or the loss of ideas. But none of that is what's actually going on in Psalm 137. Psalm 137 is about political and social oppression. It is about slavery and exile and power and unfeeling masters. It references a time of famine and poverty when the center of a community was defiled and the city destroyed. How can we relate to that? How should we relate to Psalm 137? What happened in 6th century Jerusalem is really not so different from what's happening right now in 21st century Honduras, less than 3,000 miles away, as close to these pews as is Washington, D.C., our capital. San Pedro Sula is a city in the northwest of Honduras. Poverty and gangs occupy its streets. There are no jobs for the citizens. The drinking water is contaminated. Hungry children snack on sardines they catch swimming in the city's open sewer lines. In San Pedro Sula, one in four children will not finish primary school. For those who do study, there's little opportunity and show little motivation. This poverty provides a rich harvest of desperate people for gangs like MS-13. These gangs terrorize the people through an extortion they call a war tax. Since there are no jobs, many people have no way to pay the war tax. And apparently, if you don't pay with money, you pay with your life. People hide in their houses, fearing for their lives, or they emigrate. The streets of San Pedro Sula are lined with the abandoned houses of people who could not pay the war tax and left for the U.S. to avoid certain death. The gangs take over these houses, or casas locas, and use them for kidnapping, rape, and torture. The gangs extort for lives as well as money. They recruit young men and they don't take no for an answer. The sons of San Pedro Sula have three options. They can join the gang. Since they're more likely to get shot than to get a job, the gang is the most secure option. Two, instead of joining a gang, they can join a caravan north, but they better do it quickly. Three, they can stay and resist. They can remain with their families in the home and a country that they love, and be killed eventually by the gangs, who watch them constantly and will track down every mother's son. The citizens of San Pedro Sula do not report any of these threats against their lives and livelihood. They fear retribution from the gangs, and they know that the gangs are in league with the police. 
There is no recourse, no justice, no security. This is what it means to wait and apply for legal crossing into the United States. Untold years of abject poverty, abject fear, years waiting for a rubber stamp while your sons <coughs> kill or get killed, while your children starve and drink diseased water, while you remain a prisoner in your home, just waiting for the gangs to come around again and take that last little bit of money you have to live on. In these conditions, which we can hardly imagine, the options and the consequences get really clear. You stay and die, or you leave and hope to somehow not be deported. You've heard that in the US, you'll be treated like an animal, like a contamination, like a criminal. But these humiliations and dangers are still more acceptable than death. So you arrive at the US border and claim refugee status. You are told that in order to gain asylum, you must have proof of the threats against your life. But you can provide no proof, because if you had reported to the police, you would already be dead. Without the paper trail, the agents will not let you file a claim. You are processed as a criminal and await deportation. This sounds even worse than that one. These refugees are prisoners of the in-between. They can't go back to a destroyed home, and they're not allowed to find a new one in the United States or in Mexico. They wander back and forth in the desert, looking for a promised land that has yet to materialize. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? So where are we in this story? Where is the little white chapel in the 2019 revised edition of Psalm 137? This is a question we can answer. We are where we are. We are where we can help. We are where solidarity is most needed. We live safely on the side of a border these Honduran refugees dream about. By an accident of birth, we were not born Jewish in 6th century BCE Jerusalem. And by another accident of birth, we were not born poor in 21st century Honduras. No, by an accident of birth, we live in a country where we can vote for politicians who make and can break the policies that say to these modern Hebrews, go back, we don't want you here. By an accident of birth, we have the freedom to protest these inhumane policies by taking to the streets, teaching our neighbors, and talking to our elected officials. By an accident of birth, we here do not spend our lives, our days, fearing for our lives. Let us extend our surplus, our security, our refuge, to make a new promised land. Let us sacralize this accident of birth.